Bom dia, boa tarde, boa noite, or whatever the case may be. My name is Marcus, and I am the host of the Black Brazil Today YouTube channel, as well as the BlackBrazilToday.com uh, blog, where I analyze Brazil from the perspective of race. So as, as always, um, this video is something that I'm covering from the actual blog post. And all of the blog posts that I put up, the ideas always come from, you know, various sources, whether it's just uh, an article that caught my eye, you know, an incident that happened in Brazil, or something that I, I really like to do is when something happens either in Brazil or the United States, and there's an incident there's, that's similar to it in, you know, the opposite country. This, is, this has happened a lot of times over the years where, you know, something happened in one or the other country, like, you know, and then maybe months or and sometimes years later, something similar happens in the other country. So um, the, the story that I'm going to talk about today, or we'll say the report, the analysis was actually from some years ago. I don't know, it might have been 2018 or 19, somewhere in there. But it recently came to the forefront again, not necessarily the story from Brazil, but the argument, the discussion, the debate that was uh, started in the United States a couple of months ago says, hmm, this is something similar to what people, I remember people were talking about in Brazil, maybe, like I said, back three or four years ago. So, you know, I'm always inspired. I always get, you know, different ideas from, you know, just people talking or some hot story that's in the news or something. And this story is no different. So what am I talking about today? And how did it come about? As I get into it, you'll figure out, you'll hear, because I'm going to tell you, well, what made me want to cover this story is because, again, I put these two stories together. You know, something that happened recently here versus something that happened in Brazil four years ago. And it just makes for, a, you know, an intriguing story. So salary inequality in soccer or what Brazilians like to call football, because, you know, around the world, outside of the United States, you know, soccer is called football. But if you're talking about the United States, if you're in Brazil and you're talking about football in the United States, you have to say football americano, because in other parts of the world, soccer is football and <laughs> football and football, what Brazilians call it and the rest of the world calls it, is called soccer in the United States. So why does Neymar earn 170 times 175 times more than Marta. It may surprise you, but it's not because of gender discrimination. A lot going on here. Um, I, I wanted to touch on this again for a few reasons. And one of the reasons is because, you know, I've always been someone who's been into analysis of different uh, areas of society. You know, why is it that, you know, when you look at the black population, or whatever country you go to, it seems like black people earn less money than white people or other, you know, social or ethnic groups. Now, uh, for many years, social activists will explain like, well, it's totally, it's racism, it's, it's racial discrimination at its finest, right? And what I'm saying is, you know, as a person who I consider myself leftist for many years, but then, you know, some years ago, I'm like, uh, eh, wasn't really happy with where the left was going. And I start also started just seeing um, the contradictions in the left, right? Um, I started seeing this whole race game as almost like a hustle to a degree. This is not to say that everything is all equal or we are all equal, as a lot of Brazilians like to say, when the topic is race. But I think it is a little bit more complex than what the left wants, to, wants us to believe. Um, I don't know. Somebody has said this in Brazil some years ago. Like, it doesn't really matter whether you're left or right. The point is, we're, <laughs> if you're black, you're black. You know, I don't think black people will find comfort in either side of the left or the right because it's problematic on both sides. But we should be able to talk about that. All right. So uh, one of the main things I've, and I've, you know, obviously I've studied the situation in the U.S., United States. I've looked at the situation in Brazil. And along with the discussion on race, you get a lot of, uh, you know, opinions coming out of the feminist community, we'll say. And you'll often see, you know, statistics that says, well, you know, black women are discriminated against because they're women and because they're black. 
And when you get into sociologists or economists, for example, they go a little bit more in depth and they show like, well, this doesn't quite explain the whole issue as to why it seems that black women, you know, are on the bottom of the uh, social pyramid in terms of salary. It's like, OK, can we really just define this as only a race issue or is there something else going on here? The same thing here when we talk about. Uh, salary differentials and we compare, uh, you know, women versus men. And the, the obvious you know, point is going to be in the same way that we talk about race, where, OK, we're going to say that it's because of racism that black people earn less money than white people. And in the same sense, we're going to say that women earn less money because they're women in, compare, in, com in comparison to men. And what you find when you dig a little bit deeper into that is like, OK, it's not exactly this. Like nobody's going to deny that we can have certain elements of uh, discrim gender based discrimination. But instead of comparing apples to oranges and you start comparing apples to apples, it, we get a clear picture of, you know, why, what, what's going on with the dynamic of men making more money than women. This article today, as I said, I think it, people were talking about this like 2018 or 2019, and it is a perfect example of why this issue is a little deeper than what we're going to see just on the surface. So first of all, you know, as a lot of Americans I know may not necessarily watch soccer, I, I know that, you know, growing up in the United States in Detroit, soccer was just not a sport that we played in the street. The only time that I ever remember playing soccer when I was in grade school and even high school was when we were forced to play soccer during, you know, the gym period. You know, people always complain like, man, who, I don't want to play this sport. It was like, in the hood, you play one of three sports. You know, whether you're playing a pickup game, you're playing baseball, football, or basketball. That was it. Um, I wasn't really much exposed to soccer. It just wasn't a big sport in the United States. It just wasn't. Let's just be honest about it. You know, I I would I remember once upon a time you had the North American Soccer League. You know, I would look at some of my father's old magazines and see, you know, there was you know, I think it was like in the late, the mid to late seventies, it was a big deal when, uh, the king of soccer, uh, the king who uh, hate the footy ball was the, Bra the Brazilian say, uh, Pelé. He went to the New York Cosmos in the North American soccer league at the time, because they were trying to make soccer a bigger sport in the United States. It never really succeeded. You know, the league folded some years later, uh, from what I understand there's another soccer league that's, uh, you know, it's trying to get, again, become one of the top sports along with baseball, basketball, and football. So to be honest with you, uh, I'm still, in, in the last decade, maybe decade and a half, I've really just moved away from sports altogether. You know, uh, I watched a lot of sports up to certain eras, and each one I just kind of pulled back because, you know, you know, you have other responsibilities in life. And it's like, you know, you're watching a bunch of millionaires running up and down the field or the court or whatever. And it's like, you know, it's entertaining, but, you know, I'm not going to stop my life to watch sports. And I've really, you know, while I was in Sao Paulo, the really the only time of year that I would watch American football was, you know, during the Super Bowl. It's, that's just how it was. You know, um, Sundays, you know, I would spend with a particular fan, family every Sunday and they would always have a soccer match on. So I never really got into the sport. You know, not to the point where I know all the rules and all of the history and all of that stuff, but watching getting into soccer is because I got into Brazil in like, again, you know, late 1999 and in the year 2000. And if you're going to deal with Brazil, there's certain aspects of dealing with Brazil that you cannot escape. And my first few years studying Brazil, it coincided with the World Cup of 2002. And that was the first time I can remember ever really getting into the World Cup. Um, I remember in 1994, and it was a video that I made about this. I remember 1994, like, you know, the Cowboys had, the Dallas Cowboys had won another Super Bowl. I remember, you know, the Houston Rockets, New York Knicks, NBA final series. And I remember the famous Bronco chase that interrupted one of those games. So I remember 94 very well. But right in 1994, June and July, you had the World Cup happening in the United States. And, was, you know, I heard a little bit about it. But as I said, I never followed. I never followed soccer.
you know, so it was just like, okay, they're playing soccer. The World Cup is going on. It's being played in the United States. I just didn't get into it because I have soccer is just not really part of uh I'm not going to say Americans don't watch it at all. There are a lot of Americans who watch soccer, but in the black community, we just didn't watch much soccer. It just wasn't something we got excited about. Um, but, you know, following Brazil, I got to learn that you, Brazil is like a factory for some of the greatest, you know, soccer players ever in the world. So I can just remember some of the stars of that 2002 team. That was, it's been 20 years since world, <laughs> since Brazil won a, a world cup. That's, that's a pretty long drought. Uh, I think um, before that, they went 24 years from 1970 to 1994 before they got another World Cup title. So now we're talking about 2002 to 2020, and it's already 2022, and we're already 20 years since Brazil last won a World Cup. Um, I remember that team. I remember being introduced to people like Ronaldo and Ronaldinho Gaúcho and uh, what was it, Hivaldo, and a couple other guys I remember from that team. Um so that, that got me at least a little bit interested in soccer, but still not to the point where I'm going to be watching this game every week, every day or whatever. I just, you know, I remember <laughs> there were some times in Sao Paulo where some of the guys, some of the Brazilian guys would be like, look, you teach me American football and we'll teach you about, you know, football Brasileiro, right? And we would just kind of trade because both of us were a little bit confused about the two sports, right? So anyway, a little bit later after Ronaldo's time passed, after Ronaldinho's time passed, these were both, you know, named, these were both guys who were named the best soccer players in the world. You know, they both had these awards. Um, then this, this, uh, this other guy, now this was a white Brazilian. I think his name was Kaká. He won like the best player of the year, you know, for, you know, the FIFA, you know, best soccer player of the year. So like I said, Brazil seems to be a factory for promoting, creating and raising and training just like some of the best soccer players in the world. So then somewhere around 2010, I started hearing about this kid named Neymar. He was about 18 at the time. And a lot of people were arguing that, you know, this dude's a superstar. He's already a star. Brazil needs him to be on the new World Cup team to help us win another World Cup. Now, he didn't get called up that year. He got called up, I believe, in 2014. Actually, when Brazil hosted the World Cup, that was the infamous year where they just got dusted. <laughs> you know, obliterated by Germany. It was like seven to one. If any of you might remember that game, it was like, <laughs> they, I remember all the magazines at the time, like this was a national disgrace. You know, Brazil had never been that humiliated in a World Cup match before. So, but the thing is, Neymar's fame internationally, and this is Neymar, the guy on the left, if you've never heard of him, Neymar is, he's been one of the top paid you know, soccer ball, soccer players for, I want to say probably about eight, maybe nine years since he went over to Europe. You know, all of us Brazilian soccer players, they always start off in the leagues in Brazil, but when they want to go to make big money, hundreds of millions of dollars, then they have to go over to Europe. So this is exactly what, uh, what Neymar done. He he followed the, the trail of other of previous uh, Brazilian superstars. Um, there was an article that I did some years ago where they just showed how many Brazilians there are in European soccer leagues and, you know, in Asian soccer leagues, right? So this, this is a big thing. So I remember by about 2013, 2014, Neymar's face was literally everywhere in Brazil. He was the pitch boy for so many different products. I mean, he was just, he was everywhere. He, he became a superstar. And you know how it gets when, when, when athletes earn a lot of money, they earn more money off the field than they do on the field. You know, everybody knows the classic example of Michael Jordan, you know, up until what was it like when he returned to the bulls after his retirement to baseball, you'd be surprised to know. It's like, I thought I saw something where it said up until 93, I think Jordan's between, when he came in the league in 84 up to 93. I think he made about $28 million with the bulls or something like that. It was like, it was incredible because when he came back for the 95, 96 season, I think he made more money in one season than he did all of those years before he retired in 93. Of course, Michael Jordan was making massive amounts of money off the court, you know, with Nike and other endorsements. Neymar is something like that. He makes, <laughs> I have to go back and look, but this dude was making like, I don't know, 80, 90, a hundred million dollars a year or something like that. So I, I wanted to analyze this today because Neymar is considered one of the top 
Brazilian soccer players in the world. He's one of the top paid. And on the right here, this is uh, Marta. She's considered one of the top female soccer players in the world. So this is this is what the article is about. It's analyzing, okay, how much does Neymar make? How much does Marta make? And if there is indeed a difference, which there is, it's an enormous difference. Like, okay, why is that? You know, what is it that makes Neymar earn so much more money than than uh, than Marta? And as I said, I'm going to get into what what sparked me to cover this story. So let's go ahead and get into this for now. So the origins of today's post started with a video that I watched on YouTube, I guess, a couple of months ago. You got to love comedians, especially those who know how to break down a current debate or analyze a social issue that many people are thinking about. I like comedians who have the nerve to say things out loud that many of us were simply thinking but didn't say out loud or perhaps did say and got mad pushback from others who couldn't believe that they said it. The latter has been me more times than I can remember for at least the last 15 years of my life. I always love it when people look at me in shock, don't want to hear what I'm saying, can't debate the topic or my favorite label, label me a conspiracy theorist. Right. My thing is, no. I don't believe in every conspiracy theory that's out there, but then again, when and if you do enough research on a certain topic and you can back up your claims with facts, at some point, the topic leaves from in, being in the realm of the conspiracy theory and becomes simply conspiracy. Don't bother asking me what conspiracies I'm talking about because this is not the platform for such discussions. But today I will discuss a type of conspiracy theory that we've long heard about for years. And this is what I'm talking about, the idea that women are being held back by all of these corporations around the world simply because they're women. OK, does this point stand up? Let me just say, for years, I have supported the idea that certain groups of people are victims of an enormous conspiracy whose goal is to keep them, quote unquote, in their place. I've discussed this much on this blog in terms of the position of black Brazilians in Brazilian society. Don't get me wrong. I am not completely backpedaling on my position. It's just that I know that every time you believe in something, you must be willing to test your conclusions, even if the results show that what you believe is completely wrong. To be specific, we must question the idea of how certain groups are being legitimately held back other explanations for their situations, and also question how many of them are at least partially to blame for their own condition. Let's take the question of salary differences according to gender. The obvious argument here is that women earn, on average, less money than men simply because they are women. But does the gender question really explain why men earn more money than women, or are there other factors to consider? When comedian Bill Burr brought, brought up the issue of why female soccer and basketball players earn significantly less money than their male counterparts, he drove this point home. It's not simply a question of skill or gender, and this should be quite obvious. For those of you who haven't seen this clip, you definitely have to watch it because he blew me away. I've had to watch this clip or listen to it for maybe 10 times now because I want to hear somebody dispute what he's saying. Because there have been economics professors who have pointed out some of the same things that he's saying, breaking it down. OK, why do women in the WNBA earn less money than men in the NBA? Is it simply because they're women or is there something else going on here? If you chose the latter, then gold star for you. So after having heard the bit a few times, as I said, maybe 10 times, I remembered that this same topic had been debated in Brazil several years before, which is what I want to discuss today. Some years ago, there was a discussion going on online that asked the question, why does Marta make so much less money than Neymar? If you're not a fan of soccer or what Brazilians call football, you may not even know who Marta and Neymar are. For years now, Neymar, hard to believe a guy just turned 30. Actually, I, I forget. I don't, a couple of months ago, I think he, he actually turned 30. Um, always looked at him as kind of like the boy wonder. Um, he's been one of the highest paid soccer players in the world. And his name has appeared on a number of posts on this very blog. On the other hand, Marta, one of the greatest women to ever kick a soccer ball around, is still a personality that I really haven't discussed at length, even though she has appeared on a few posts. Um, so just to, to get into that just a little bit. 
Neymar has been a topic that I have talked about at length on this blog, and for good reason, because, as I said, my interest in Brazil is studying it and analyzing it from the perspective of race. And there's a number of articles here that talk about Neymar. Um, the first time I heard about the guy, I read a, you know, a, a, an interview with him in Folha de Sao Paulo, which is, uh, you know, it's the Brazil's top newspaper. It's kind of like the New York Times. And Neymar made headlines when he said that in the interview, he was asked if he had ever suffered racism because the discussion of racism was growing more and more in a country that has always denied that it even existed. And Neymar, he was like, well, I've never experienced racism either on the field or off the field. And, but that's because I'm not really black, you know? Right. And I was always wondering what he meant by that. Does he mean he's clear? He's just not black or the word that he used, il no so preto, like I'm not black. But remember in Portuguese, you have two terms for black, you preto or negro. So for some people, Preto represents very clearly dark-skinned Black people, whereas the term Negro is supposed to encompass all Black people under one um, umbrella, umbrella term. So I was always questioned, does Neymar, is he saying he's absolutely not Black, or is he saying he's not Preto, meaning he's not dark-skinned? He never really cleared that up, and, but that was just like the first story uh, the first time Neymar raised abra eyebrows with his stance on his racial identity. N Neymar, for a lot of people, represents how a lot of Brazilians are. It's like this article here from 2020. All Black Brazilians are Neymar in terms of racial identity. And what, what this article is basically saying, he represents millions of Black Brazilians or would-be Black or pardos or mixed people who have always skirted the idea that they could actually be Black. They've been taught that they're not. And again, you know, it's not for me to say. Often when I had this discussion with people in Brazil, I'll just tell them like, okay, look, I don't know how you self-identify. You know, that's personal for you. And I suspect that there's probably other Brazilians here who probably see you as black, but then they don't call you black. They don't call you negro. They'll call you moreno or mulato or mestizo or pardo or something. And it gives these people the idea that they're not black. Um. So I can't tell people how to identify, and I wouldn't do that, but I would say that a lot of Brazilians who don't consider themselves Black, if they were to come to the United States, they would be hit with a, you know, a dose of strong reality. So this is something that um, Neymar is fascinating in this way. Here's another story. It's like an open letter to Neymar about becoming Black, right? Fascinating stories because a lot of these people identify with Neymar because They've gone through this confusion of racial identity themselves. So when they see Neymar, you know, skirting the race issue or denying that he's black, they very much identify with this. Right. Um, let me see what else we got here. So <laughs> this was back in 2016. Um, Neymar has been the target of certain racist incidents while playing in soccer fields in Europe. And his stance has always been, I just play football. So in this article, it says, after racist taunts during a game in Spain, Neymar continues Pelé's shameful history on, of silence on race issues. And, you know, Black activists have been, you know, disappointed with Pelé for many years because he became the king of football, one of the biggest symbols of soccer around the world. But at the same time, he was very quiet on the race issue. Um, Neymar has made, you know, he's made headlines for, the crazy hairstyles that he'll have, you know, he, <laughs> I remember when he bleached his hair blonde and not only did he bleach, bleach his hair blonde, but he bleached all of his facial hair blonde. I'm like, okay, where, where is he going with this? You know, here's a story called uh, Neymar and racism, a tragedy in, in four acts, Neymar's blonde ambition and the question of racism, identity and marketability of black public figures. So Neymar is an intriguing figure. All right. Um, we all know that people play the game. You know, some people have talked about Michael Jordan has steered clear of any controversial racial discussions. But in some ways, I understand why they do that. It's like, OK, you want to earn all the money you can by promoting somebody's brand and people don't want to hear about race. So in some ways, I can under, I can understand that. So a lot of articles where I've touched on the whole question of Neymar. It's a fascinating study, fascinating story, fascinating history. Um, I have to start getting into some of those. He's uh, I think he's he's still playing in France right now, if I'm not mistaken. So that's a little bit about Neymar. Let's get back into this 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 com conversation about Marta and Neymar. Um, 
So clearly being one of the best to ever lace up a pair of cleats, a lack of talent or influence are obviously not reasons why I haven't written a full piece on Marta. But as much as I've covered on this blog since 2011, there are still numerous topics I need to touch on um, having to do with the issue of race that I simply haven't gotten to. I mean, you know, in reality, uh, I could use some help on my blog because it, it, it would be a full time job to cover, particularly in the last decade when stories about race have just, I'd say, it's probably increased a thousand times since even the first decade of the 2000s. It's something you, you'll find online all the time now. And it's impossible to cover everything with just one blog. Um, Marta's case uh, is intriguing in terms of race as well. I wasn't sure how Marta identified herself in terms of race. Um, she has appeared on the cover of Hassa Brazil magazine and people within Brazil's movement for black rights also have seen her as black. And again, just so you know, Hassa Brazil, uh, there's a video that I, where, where I talked about. It. It's really the only Brazilian magazine that's targeted at the Afro-Brazilian population. And I just remember seeing Marta on the cover of one of the issues like, OK, uh, up until that point, I had never heard Marta say, Eu sou mulher negra. I'm a black woman. I, maybe she has and I just haven't noticed it because I haven't really covered her career that much. But I thought that was very revealing that she was on the cover of Hassa Brazil magazine, because generally you're going to see just all black people on the covers there. So regardless of how she defines herself, her accomplishments place her among the best of all time of any team sport, male or female. Once called Pelé in a skirt, even the king himself, Pelé, agreed with the comparison. Maybe after this article, I will really need to set aside time to give Marta her flowers. But for now, let's get into the discussion. Whether you know who Marta is or Neymar for that matter, you're sure to learn a little something about them in today's post. So again, why does Marta earn so much, so much less money than Neymar? Okay, so let's get into this. Both Neymar and Marta are standouts in what they do. Voted best player in the world six times by FIFA, Marta has a longer career, more titles, awards, and honors. Even so, she's paid less than Neymar, who is younger and has no awards like her. Is this difference in their salaries a result of machismo and discrimination against women? In a name, which is the uh, national high school exam that happens in Brazil every year, the NM 2020, a question addressed the difference between Neymar and Marta's salary. It is a great example for the salary difference between men and women. To answer it, we have to resort to philosophy. According to Karl Marx, the value of a good or service is determined by the amount of labor employed. But this has not been verified in reality. According to Marx, the value of a good asset is determined by the amount of labor employed in its production. If there is more labor, uh, there is more value. If there is less labor, the value is less. Based on this reasoning, for Marx, is, li is linked uh, to the cost of producing a good. Since the labor factor is a cost in the production process represented by the wage, goods that employ more labor in their production must cost more. Based on this reasoning, Marx reached several conclusions. The most important of these was the exploitation of labor. For him, since only a portion of the income from the good was paid to the worker, the workers were exploited by their employers. Workers of the world unite, as they would say. Marx also concluded on this premise that capitalism was doomed to fail. As there was a tendency for wages to fall due to the Industrial Reserve Army and increase of profits, capitalism would suffer a crisis of overproduction, which would lead to its end. But you know what? Marx was wrong on absolutely everything. The Marxist theory of value is a kind of terraplanism in economics. Price is linked to value, not to the amount of labor. People's willingness to purchase something changes, at, and as that willingness changes, so does the price. When an institution pays Neymar more, it expects to make more profit from him. This, in fact, happens. If he didn't bring a return, he wouldn't receive such a high salary. If they pay Marta less, it's because she brings less profit in comparison. Even so, Marta is the second highest paid woman in women's soccer today. 
The comparison with Neymar, who was paid more than his male colleagues, is disproportionate and gives the idea that she is paid less because she's a woman. To evaluate only the number of goals and awards and compare the salary being insufficient and does not lead to the conclusion that there is discrimination, we need to go further. Consider these questions. How many fans watch Neymar's game and how many watch Marta's game? Does she sell her sponsor's products as well as he does? Are the ticket prices for her matches sold in the same quantity and at the same value? In general, are the audiences for men's soccer proportional to those for women's soccer? Is the reality of women's soccer as strong in Brazil as the men's? These are factors to be considered as well. Now, going back, the, the first question speaks volumes. Um, when Bill Burr asked the question, he says, well, <laughs> nobody's going to women's soccer games. Nobody's going to the WA women's basketball games. It's not to say they don't play good. You know, when I got into Brazil, I also started watching a little bit of the WNBA. One of their best players was one of the best women's basketball players in Brazilian basketball history, um, Janetti Arcane. And she was part of the team of the Houston Comets. They won like four straight titles, I think, from what, like 96 to 2000. So, you know, I enjoyed those games, but obviously people don't really care for women's basketball. So, if you're constantly attracting 500 to 1,000 to 2,000 fans at a game and, bat, you know, NBA basketball games are drawing 15 to 20,000, there's part of the difference you see there. Um, this is something that Bill Burr talked about. I mean, it might sound like a joke, but when you really analyze the numbers, this is what leads to such a, a difference in salary. Exemplifying Marx's theory even further, if two, two hours are used in the creation of a product, both should have the same price. But what about who made the product, the rarity, people's desire to have it, and the art involved? This is not considered in his theory. To talk about salary is not to talk about male and female sex, but about the market. For example, uh, PSG, which is Neymar's team, Paris Saint-Germain, sells 1 million euros worth of short of shirts in one day through Neymar. His high salary is not a male enhancement. The player brings profit and pays himself. Marta earns $400,000 a year, according to an agreement between her sponsors and the team where she plays in Sweden. She has the second highest salary in the world of women's soccer, second only to American star Alex Morgan, who currently plays for the San Diego Wave and has a salary of about $450,000 a year. In the face of all this controversy, some flags were raised. Among them, that Marta earned badly because she is a woman. However, it is worth it to make it clear that Marta earns more than 99% more of, of professional male players who play in Brazil, according to data from the CBF, or the Brazilian Football Federation. By the way, 96% of players who play in the country of soccer earn less than 5,000 reais per month. So this is another reality, as I said, when Brazilian players get to a certain level of stardom and they are able to attract the attention of, of teams overseas, they often leave Brazil for greener pastures over in Europe. It's, it, it, how can I say it? Like I say, Brazil being a factory of great soccer players, they can't earn those huge salaries in Brazil because it's just not there. You have a few players who might make a lot of money, but to make a whole lot of money, they often they have to go over to Europe. So therefore, we bust two myths in one shot. Does a soccer player earn well in Brazil? It is quite different from what people fantasize. The average salary of soccer players in Brazil is lower than the average salary of teachers. Does Marta earn poorly because she's a woman? No. First of all, she earns very well, and she still earns more than 99% of the male soccer athletes who play in Brazil. But what if we compare her to Neymar? Does she attract the same public as Neymar? Does she sell her sponsor's product as Neymar does? Neymar plays for 77,000 fans on average per game. Marta, despite her genius on the field, plays for 1,000 fans per game with her club. We need to understand that we earn proportionally for our rarity, for what we are capable of producing, and for the impact we generate in the market. 
often, as in the case of athletes, depending on the impact that a particular sport has on the country, an athlete can be valued more or less. Rugby players are not even professionalized in Brazil, while in New Zealand, they are national heroes. Therefore, if a Brazilian is a rugby phenomenon, there is no point in complaining that he earns poorly in Brazil. It's better that he moves to New Zealand where the market gives him more value. Alex Morgan, San Diego's athlete, besides her salary, receives a few million dollars a year in advertising contracts signed with big companies. They compete for her image because Morgan sells well, conveys good credibility, and on the field, she's a national star. She wins by the impact she generates in the market by what she sells and by the attributes of her image that, uh, that companies want to incorporate in their brands. She also earns more than the overwhelming majority of male soccer players playing in the United States. Hmm. Need to read that again. She earns her, she being Alex Morgan, also earns more than the overwhelming majority of male soccer players playing in the U.S. Again, that's because soccer is still not a big sport in the United States, right? So it makes perfect sense when you think about it. How are you going to pay these athletes, all these athletes top dollar? When they're bringing in a, fact, a fraction of the sponsorship, a fraction of the fans, it makes per perfect sense. So when it comes to talking about athlete salaries, we need to talk about market, not gender. After all, these two talented female players are at the top of the pyramid. Both Marta and Neymar are outstanding and nobody dares to disagree with that. However, they are paid differently. And in this respect, Neymar beats Marta by a landslide. In his transfer to PSG, Neymar was valued at $600 million for a period of five years. $250 million went to Barcelona, his former club, while the former Santos player will receive $350 million for the period. Now, Santos is a city on the coast of Sao Paulo State, and that's the team that Neymar played for in Brazil before he went over to Spain and Barcelona, Europe, to, for greener pastures. Or earn, or, like I said, you can't earn really the money in Brazil that you would earn over in, in Europe, which is why so many players, you know, go over there after a few years in Brazilian leagues. In addition, Forbes estimates that Neymar receives around $17 million per year from advertising and sponsorships. In other words, Neymar earns approximately 175 times more than Marta if we consider only their salaries as soccer players. It is a big difference, isn't it? And here comes the economic analysis. So again, is this difference really the result of machismo or discrimination against women? Or is the difference driven by economic issues? Are you still wondering why PSG pays so much for Neymar? Why, while Orlando Pride pays so little, comparatively speaking, for Marta? By paying that amount to Neymar, PSG believes that they will be able to maximize profits, have a higher level of utility when compared to the scenario without Neymar. After closing the deal with Barcelona and the Brazilian player, PSG's manager, Nasser Al-Khalifa, Khalifi, stated that the club became worth 300 million euros more. The club also increased its revenue with tickets, products, image rights, among other forms of income linked to the Brazilian player. The same rationale applies to, name, to uh, Marta, but with different values as we have seen. Since the male soccer audience is much larger than the female soccer audience, the marginal gain obtained by PSG with Neymar is much higher than the marginal gain obtained by the Orlando Pride with Marta. Again, this is the point that Bill, Barr was, Bill Burr was making. Um, nobody watches the WN, WNBA basketball games. This, when you make that comparison, how can you justify the same salary? Maybe you can say these women are highly skilled basketball players, but a lot of people just are not into watching WNBA basketball games. I mean, like he said in that point, you know, the, if we statistics tell us that in almost every country, I would assume probably every country in the world and in a global population, women do outnumber men. If they want to see women soccer players and basketball players earning money on par with NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball uh, players, they should be packing this, the, the stadiums and the arenas. This is clearly not happening. And this is what the example that we're seeing in the comparison between Marta and Neymar. So what is the conclusion? In economic terms, Neymar is worth much more than Marta. 
This is not a question of gender discrimination against women or misogyny. It is an economic issue. The higher the marginal utility of a good asset, the higher its price value. We can apply the same reasoning to any market. If, for example, we consider the value of models, male and female, we will see that female models earn much more than male models. Go Giselle Benchin. <laughs> Interesting that uh, Miss, Miss Giselle is in the news now because uh, of what's going on between her and Tom Brady. You know, her husband wants to continue playing a little bit, and obviously she doesn't like that idea. So I guess they got a little bit of beef going on. So, by the way, it is interesting to note that Gisele Bengtian, a supermodel, earned twice as much or more than her husband, the super athlete Tom Brady, during his career. Now, can anyone help to explain to me why this is? So I think all that's been said here that I think I've said everything that's necessary. I will explore this topic a little bit more. Um, this is just looking at it in a comparison between two soccer players or male superstar and a female super, superstar and how this argument pans out. Or if the argument that is discrimination based on gender, it, it seems like it was completely debunked, but there's more to this. You know, this is just analyzing these two soccer players. There's studies that are coming out of Brazil and obviously out of the United States and other countries that show it, when, when crunching the data, we have to deal with what the facts are saying instead of what we feel might be right. So uh, I'm going to definitely tackle this issue more in terms of just a regular labor market than making a specific argument uh, debate about Neymar or Marta because what the economics portion of the argument is saying is like, look, it's very obvious why Neymar and Marta don't make the same amount of money, just as the difference between the NBA and the WNBA, you know, the same rationale, the same numbers, the same data really supports that fact. So with that said, um, tell me what you thought about today's video. Um, how do you feel about female athletes earning so much less than male athletes? Do you think the argument that was presented in today's article explains why there is this differential in, in salary? Because this argument can be made in just several areas in the, late, in the labor market. You know, like I said, I will be covering that in a, you know, a future article. But for now, if you like this, uh, this video, uh, drop a comment. What did you think about this? Um, consider subscribing to the, ch to the channel. Um, I'm trying to keep pumping out videos, you know, as much as I can and click on that, uh, that notification button got, got a whole lot more to talk about. So, um, I, I hope you come along with me for the ride. So until next time I'm out.